of 1965, or 1865, sorry, uh, we were coming to the conclusion of the bloodiest battle in human, in, in American history, uh, not human, but in American history, and it was around that same time that people began for the first time to stop and, and remember those who had fallen for the cause of freedom in our, in our, in our country, and we began to celebrate uh, Memorial Day. It later became an actual certified holiday, but it was at that time that they began to celebrate it. So what I'd like to do this morning as we think about Memorial Day weekend is just take a moment to pause and have a moment of silence as we think about those friends, family, loved ones, and all of those that have given their lives for the sake of our freedom. Uh, so would you please bow your heads and join me, and then I'll uh, pray in just a moment. Father, we, uh, we are humbled by the thought of uh, someone giving their life for us. Um, we're humbled by the thought of the American soldier and the families that are impacted when, when some brave soldier loses his life for our freedom. But it's also an incredible reminder of what you gave for our freedom from sin. And so, Lord, as we acknowledge and we honor those that have, that have laid down the ultimate sacrifice, we are reminded of the sacrifice you made for us as well. And I pray, Lord, that your peace, that peace that passes all understanding, would be upon the families uh, of those that are remembering this weekend the great sacrifice that was, that was given by their own family members during different conflicts that we've faced as a country. And I pray, Lord, that you would be their peace, that you would be their shield, that you would be their comfort during this time. And Lord, I pray that as we go through this weekend, that we'll have fun and we'll have barbecues and we'll do a lot of great stuff, but I pray that we'll be reminded of the immense sacrifice that people have made for our freedom and that we'll be reminded of the ultimate sacrifice your son paid for us. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. We're continuing on a five-week series called Everybody that Pastor Paul has taken us two weeks through already. This is week three. Um, today, specifically, I'm going to be talking about the idea that we're image bearers, and we're going to be looking at our identity, what that means, where we find our identity, all of those things that go with it. But before we do that, I thought it would be helpful to recap a little bit about where we've been um, this, uh, the primary theme of this series is the idea that we are embodied spirits. The human soul is in a symbiotic relationship uh, between our minds, body, souls, heart, all of that together. A, a couple of big p uh, key points that we talked about along the way is that we're not us without our bodies, so we should love and honor our bodies. We also talked about that our bodies are a gift from God, so we should accept them as a trust or we should be stewards of the bodies that God has given us in order to fulfill the calling the Lord has put on us and our vocation. And then we talked about our bodies have uh, been corrupted by this thing called sin or disordered desires. And unfortunately from that, we realize that if we give in to our disordered desires, that creates slavery to sin. But if we deny those same disordered desires, it creates freedom in our life. And so today, like I said, we're going to talk about how our identity affects all of that. Um, before we jump into that, though, I wanted to take us back to Romans 1, verse 18 through 25. It says this, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world, in the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. What he's basically saying is, because of the very creation around us, the waves crashing on the shore, the, the mountains, the rocks, the heavens, the, the sun, the moon, the stars, the, the complexity of our galaxy, and even the complexity of our human bodies, all point to one undeniable thing, and that, that is there is a creator. And our job then 
in real, realizing that there's a creator is to worship the creator, not the creation. But what he's saying is we didn't do that. Verse 21 says, so although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal men and birds and animals and creeping things. Therefore, God gave them up to the lusts of their hearts, to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served the creation rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. Essentially, in this world, you're going to put your faith, your hope, and ultimately your identity in one of two things, either in something that is the creation or on to the creator. And so what, what the, this scripture is telling us is that everybody, eventually he gets to Romans 3 and he says that all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, meaning that we've all turned toward our hope, faith, and identity towards created things instead of the creator. The problem is mistaken identity always leads to disordered desires. Genesis 1.27 so says that God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. This is where we get the Latin phrase imago Dei, which just means we are image bearers. We bear the image of the king of kings and lord of lords. And as image bearers, our, our design is to worship the creator, not the creation. That was our purpose so when we worship creation instead of God, we lose ourselves. We lose the original identity we're given, our meaning, and ultimately our destiny. But when we understand and submit to our new identity in Christ, that order then returns and we begin to rediscover meaning and our God-given destiny. Hence why we're going to talk about identity today and why it's so important. The bottom line of what I want you to get out of this morning is this. Experiencing God's meaning and destiny for your life is impossible unless we embrace our new identity in Jesus Christ. Before we do that, I want to I open us in prayer and tell you a little story about myself. Father, as we um, continue this morning, I pray that you will show us in new and powerful ways uh, that you will reveal to us through the power of your Holy Spirit this morning our identity in you, and give us a deeper understanding of how the more we're connected to our identity in Christ, the more we'll be able to avoid those disordered desires, and that we'll be able to honor you with our bodies, and we'll honor others as well. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. When I was 13 years old, I was coming back from church with my aunt and uncle. Uh, back in my middle school years, I spent a lot of time with my aunt and uncle because uh, they had a couple of uh, kids that I was very fond of, my cousins. We spent tons of time together, and they were about the same age I was. So um, this particular weekend, though, we were at church, and uh, the communion cup was passed around. And when it, uh, my, each of my cousins took communion, and then when it got to me, I started to take it, and my aunt swatted my hand. Bam! I was like, what the heck? She's like, that's not for you. They all took it. It looked like the entire rest of the congregation took it. And in that moment, it felt like the entire congregation found out that I wasn't allowed to take it. So I was super ticked off. And at, my last name is Fott, and there's a reason to that. Um, I was ticked off, and I was going to let her know about it. So on the way home in the minivan, I explained to her that I was very unhappy that she treated me that way and didn't let me take communion. I didn't understand why. So everybody, she started to talk to me. She basically began to describe the gospel to me and what was important about the gospel. We eventually got to her house and the rest of the family filed out why she uh, explained the gospel to me. And it was there in her minivan that I first asked Jesus to be my savior. Very cool. But unfortunately, from that point, I was baptized a couple, like a couple weeks later, but then I went off into high school the next year. And in that time, I became obsessed with the game of football. I watched every game I could in the NFL. I, I wanted to have this awesome thing called football in my life. So I became obsessed with it. Watching it, working out, trying to get better and better and better. I, I wanted to eventually, hopefully start on varsity and then maybe get seen by a Division I school and then maybe eventually play in the NFL. Now, nobody at the time said to me, 
Brian, 5'9 and 175 is very rarely found in the NFL. No one told me that. Would have been helpful information back then. But I, I continued as if it was absolutely possible, and I worked my tail off. See, here's the problem. I know by looking at me, it, you probably can't tell, but I'm not, a, I'm not very athletically gifted. I know it's hard to tell, but <laughs> here's my point. Because I wasn't very athletically gifted, and there's a few guys in here that I, I play basketball with a few days a week, they absolutely know that I'm not very athletically gifted. In fact, there's a hole in the wall at the ETS place over there from where I, my unathleticness uh, trying to get you a ball as it was going out of bounds and then ran right into perfectly between the, uh, where the, uh, uh, the wood studs are and went, almost went through the wall. It's great. Hence, not very athletic. So because I wasn't very athletic, I needed to work harder than everybody else. So I did. I was in the weight room every day. I busted my tail. I tried to do everything I could to compensate for a lack of athletic talent. And as I, as I went along in high school, more and more, I started to see that pain off and was able to finally uh, see the, the field my, my junior year. My senior year came around, and I thought, this is the year. This is the year I'm going to get noticed. So I worked so hard. I, I made sure that whenever they needed anybody for anything, I jumped in. Didn't matter what the position was. I think even one time I tried to jump in at quarterback and the coach told me to get out. Um, I don't understand. I think I can throw the ball. Anyway, so I, I worked hard. I, I was starting two ways as a senior, as, both as, a, as an offensive guard and as a linebacker. And I remember this, uh, it was the third game of the season we were on the one-yard line at Austin Stadium because back then, a lot of the high school uh, uh, teams didn't have their own field in Eugene, so they all used where the Ducks play. That was super cool, except for back then, the turf was like this really thin carpet thrown over, uh, over concrete, which is horrible for you. Um, anyway, so we're on the one-yard line. Focus, Brian. Tell the story. Okay. Uh, we're on the one-yard line, and I must have heard the play wrong. Because 10 men went to the right and one man went to the left. So I had to be wrong. That's what they tell me. Anyway, as I went to the left, the guard went to the right and he landed on my knee and it tore my MCL. So third game of the season, my senior year, I find myself sidelined for at least five to six weeks, which was super helpful when, you're, when you uh, really don't understand that you're not going to make uh, Division I football to tell yourself the lie that it's the injuries why the colleges aren't calling. That's why they're not calling. It had nothing to do with lack of talent and size and, and ability and speed. It's really this injury that's keeping them from calling. So I'm just going to rehab really hard, hopefully make it back for the last game or two in the playoffs. Uh, we didn't make the playoffs that year because we were three and six. So I had one game back. And in that one game back, I didn't show anybody anything. I could barely move in the knee brace. But that didn't discourage me. I'm like, I'm going to keep working hard. In the off season, I busted my tail, rehabbed my knee, worked on my speed, kept lifting weights, and I decided what I would do is since I didn't get a fair shake in high school, I would walk on at a Division II school, and there I would make the team, and eventually they'd see how good I am, and a Division I school picked me up, or, or maybe the NFL would just magically come find me at the Division II school. So I walk on. First two weeks of, of college uh, practice are horrible. They're meant to uh, get you to quit. Uh, they're meant to uh, physically uh, push you to the limits so that hopefully you'll either quit quit, or you'll step up. And so I worked hard, as always. I, 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 was, uh, I was part of a, a group of linebackers that were about 15 to 16 linebackers. And they, within the first week, they had started to cut. But by the, the time we got to the end of the first two weeks, and most of the cuts had been made, I found myself um, uh, the, still in the hunt, and sitting around the fifth or sixth spot. And I thought, as a freshman, fifth or sixth spot, this is great. By my sophomore year, I'll be there. Well, that Friday, uh, the, last, the, the second week of doubles, after going through all the pain of two-a-day practices, sometimes three-a-day practices, and going through all of the stuff that they do to freshmen to, to try to scare you, which works really well, um, I get to the end of the second week, and I get a, a little uh, letter uh, from the... Uh, that was left in my door of my dorm room, and it, was, it said, you need to come to the financial aid office. So I rolled up to the financial aid office, and I sat down with a lady there, and she showed me what my bill was, and it was going to be about $8,000, which may not sound like a lot now. Back then it was, but I thought, okay, this is great. Now tell me about this financial aid thing. And she's like, Brian, you haven't filled out financial aid. 
and it's too late. And I was like, what? Okay, well, can I make payments? Yeah, all of it by Monday. <laughs> and I was like, I, I can't do that. What, what's that mean? She's like, unfortunately, that means you're, you're going to need to leave the school. And see, see, here's the problem. I, I grew up in a fairly poor family, and uh, really there was very little college uh, experience in our family. My mom had gone a little bit to a community college. My brother had gone for a couple semesters to a college as well. But no one said a word to me about needing to fill out financial aid. And back then, they weren't as thorough. Guidance counselors didn't come around you the way they do nowadays to try to help you. So I go through these two horrible weeks, and I pack my stuff up, and I go home. To make matters worse, I had sat down with my linebacker coach and told him, I'll be back next year. And he looked at me and said, Brian, I need to be honest with you about something. He goes, you are one of the least athletic people I've ever met in my life. But you make up with it with heart. It was his nice way of saying, you're Rudy and you're never actually going to see the field here. And I was like, dang. And I was super mad at him. But it was the first time someone had been truly honest with me. I'll get into that maybe some other day a little bit more. But here's what happened. I was so mad, so frustrated, and felt so uh, abandoned in that moment that I began to turn to a lot of other stuff that I had always avoided because of football. I started to turn to drinking and partying, hanging out with friends and doing stupid stuff uh, with them that I shouldn't have been doing, all because I had felt abandoned. See, I had so fully, over those four or five years, put my identity in football that when it was stripped from me, I felt abandoned. I felt like um, Gollum in the Hobbit movies. Okay, sorry, nerd alert, nerd alert, nerd alert. Uh, I felt like Gollum when it said uh, the ring abandoned him. I felt like I had been abandoned by football and I didn't know what to do with my life. And so I began to party and, and for the next eight, nine months, I just became very reckless with my life. I did things I had never previously done because I wouldn't do anything to harm uh, my body. And I just started to do very, very stupid things. And I remember one particular Friday, after about nine months of this, I went to party at a friend's house. And the next morning, I woke up and I found myself in the bathroom uh, on the floor. I had, um, well, I'm not going to describe it too much, but I I'd lost control of most of my bodily functions and I was laying in my own puke. And I thought, this, this isn't good. This can't be what life is supposed to be about. See, when we put our identity in the things of this world, we lose who we were intended to be. And in that lostness, we become broken. I don't know where you're at today, but I would guess that everybody in this room can identify at some level with the idea of being lost, having the wrong identity, and feeling broken in their life. Maybe you're here today and you've never asked Jesus into your life. And so if that's you, then maybe you've never understood what your identity in God was supposed to be. And I hope today we can clear that up. But some of you have been believers for a long time, but you find yourself continually running back to the disordered desires of the flesh and because of that, you keep losing touch with your identity. Maybe it's to chase after addictions like drugs or alcohol or pornography. Maybe it's to chase after things like money. Maybe it's because you've chased after power or you've tried to manipulate other people to get your way. See, it's not just how we treat our own bodies. Sometimes it's how we treat other people's bodies that's the problem. And any of those things that, that pull us away from worshiping the God who created us and cause us to worship created things, anything that turns our hope, faith, and identity away from God leaves us broken and leaves our, our lives a mess or causes us to destroy other people's lives. And so what I want us to do today is begin to really understand what it looks like to find our identity in Christ. Because if we do that, then we will find meaning and we'll be able to uh, embrace this new identity in Christ that we've been given. The main uh, passage we're going to look at today is 1 John 3, uh, 3 through 6. If you have that, please open that in your Bibles. 
Starting in verse 3, it says, And everyone who is thus, thus hopes in him purifies himself. I want you to do me a quick favor. Underline, circle this word in your Bible. Yes, it's okay to write in your Bibles. In fact, I highly encourage it. Circle, underline the word hopes. Everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. Everyone who makes a practice, you can underline the word practice, of sinning also practices lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. You know that he appeared in order to make to take away our sins, and in him there is no sin. And verse 6 says, no one who abides, again, underline circle, uh, right in blood, no, don't do that, uh, abides in him, keeps on sinning. No one who keeps on sinning has either seen him or known him. Again, this is the word epigenosis, which is the idea of experiential knowledge. It's more than just head knowledge, it's actually experiencing. If you've experienced him, then you're not gonna return to sin is what this, Bible, this passage is, is saying. So, a couple key observations from this passage. First, the activity, yes, the activity of hoping is critical to understanding who we are in Christ and reordering our desires. There is an activity to hope. It is something we need to do. It is a practice. You're either, you're going, I said this at the beginning, you're either going to hope in creation or you're going to hope in the creator. And the practice of turning our hope away from created things, turning our identity, turning our hope, turning our faith away from created things, and turning it back to God is a, a phrase we call a Repentance. It's when we turn away from our sin and we turn towards the Lord. So whether you're a brand new believer or you don't know the Lord or you've been a believer all your life, if you've been continually finding yourself turning back towards the, the uh, disordered desires of the flesh, the action is to turn in hope and faith and find our identity back in God. It's to return to the Imago Dei, the image of God. What do we mean by hope? Romans 8, 29 says this, for those whom he for, uh, foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. This idea of being conformed to the image of the son is the idea of imago Christi, which is where we find our image back in Christ. See, Christ came, the Bible says, and lived this perfect sinless life on earth. He showed us what it would look like to live up to the idea of being a Mago Dei, image bearers of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And he showed us by living this perfect sinless life and then going to the cross and dying on our behalf so that we might return to him and then be conformed into his image. So we get back, back to our original purpose and destiny as image bearers. Great news, Philippians 1.6 says this, says, and I am sure of this, that he who begun this good work in you will bring it to completion. He's not going to stop. So no matter where you're at today, no matter how hopeless you may feel or, or how, how far away you've gotten from the Lord, if you will repent and turn your hope, identity, everything back to Christ or to Christ for the first time in your life, then he will complete this work on the day of Christ Jesus. That means you are in process. Sometimes it's three steps forward, two steps back, but you are in process of becoming like Christ. We call this process sanctification. It's the idea of becoming every day a little bit more like Jesus. Then it says in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away, behold, and the new has come. The activity of hoping is understanding that I am a new creation. The power that sin had over my life has been destroyed. When I receive Christ as my Savior and Lord, the Bible says literally the power that that sin had before in my life has been destroyed. So I no longer have to turn back to these disordered desires. I can keep my eyes fixed on Christ. Second big observation from this passage is that abide, a big word in that passage says it means literally to stay or remain. So we live our identity in Christ when we continually stay connected to him. The adventure of being with Jesus is the key to knowing him, abiding in him, and becoming like him. It's, it's, it's keeping our eyes fixed 
the Bible says, on the author and perfecter of our faith. The activity of hope is not fixating on our sin, not fixating on the disordered desires, the things of the flesh, the way that we manipulate and hurt other people, but instead fixing our eyes on Christ. How do we do it? We do it by being. The story of Mary and Martha in the Bible is such a crucial story to our faith. Mary and Martha, there's a party coming up and Jesus is on her and Martha's running around the house getting ready for it and Mary is sitting on the porch just listening to Jesus and Martha gets super ticked off. Like, hey, tell her to work. I think she was gently implying that maybe Jesus could help out too. I know my mom would have. <laughs> but, but Jesus says, Mary, or Martha, Mary has chosen what's best. See, oftentimes what we don't get is that the very act of being with Jesus is the key to keeping our hope, our faith, and our identity on him and away from the disordered desires. It's the thing that we seem to struggle with the most. It is the thing the devil is most interested in keeping us from doing. That simple action of all day, every day, spending as much time as we can keeping our eyes on him. Learning to take the practice of silence and solitude and, and investing it into all the things that we do. I'm gonna give you a little example. Yesterday, I got an awesome opportunity to spend a couple hours with my little girl, Autumn. And she just want, she's like, Dad, I, do, I refuse to sit in this house. A lot of us were, were in the house weren't feeling particularly well, not me, but... Most of my family wasn't feeling well. She had just got over whatever stomach thing she had. And she's like, I don't want to sit in the house all day. So we decided to go, go for a walk. We went down uh, by the, the, the main area by the Eau Claire River in the, in the downtown. And we found, we, we started walking around. We found a swing, like this metal seated swing. And we just started swinging it. And she started telling me all these crazy stories that I'd never known uh, we took this trip to Denver years ago, and I, we all thought it was this great trip, but some girl, uh, f- this friend of our family, told her that if she didn't brush her hair every day, she'd get cancer. So she spent the next several years brushing her hair like crazy, and we had no idea. But as I'm sitting there listening to, listening to all of her crazy little stories, immediately I had this thought in my head. This is a divine moment. This is a moment that God has picked out and set in front of me to enjoy. And the difference between having my eyes on the world versus my eyes on Christ is to realize it's a divine moment and worship him accordingly. And here's how I did it. I just said, Lord, thank you. Thank you for this moment. As she was talking, I just prayed this sound. Thank you for this moment. I recognize this as a holy moment as an awesome, awesome thing you're doing to bless me. And I just want to tell you, thank you. I love you very much. Thanks for doing this. It's a simple act, but that happens as we learn to be in the presence of Jesus more. The more and more that we practice that presence, the more and more we practice being in his presence, learn to embrace silence and, and, and God's word, the more we do that, the more we will recognize holy moments. We'll recognize when God is working. And the more we do that, the more we'll keep our eyes fixed on him and not the fleshly desires. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 through 20 says it this way. It says, or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit? Not only your body, but that means the bodies around you as well. Our temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God. You are not your own, uh, for you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. There, this temple, this, this thing that we've been given, God intends for us to be faithful with it, to give him the glory he deserves, to keep our eyes fixed on him. The more we keep our eyes fixed on him, it allows the Holy Spirit to move in us. It allows the Holy Spirit to, to help us to overcome sin and temptation in our own life. It also helps us learn to treat our brothers and sisters and all mankind the way that we were intended to treat them. Now, there's a couple of things I want to uh, talk about before we get into to next steps. 
Um, first, I, I, I want to give you the next part of the story. Um, as I laid there in my buddy's bathroom and became very aware of that I had a problem, uh, I knew that I had at home a praying mother. One person in my family at that point that really, really believed in Jesus. And she, I knew she was praying, so I realized she'll have some answers for me. So I went to my mom and I said, Mom, I, I, she, knew, she knew what I was doing. She saw me come home a mess. She smelled me. It wasn't a secret to her. And so she just said, Brian, would you, would you come with me to a prayer service this Friday? It happened to be a Friday, which is when she knew I went out to party. <laughs> Smart woman. And she, and she said, would you come to a prayer service with me? So that next Friday, I was sitting in about the first or second row. And uh, I remember the pastor, he read from Revelation 3. It was the letter to the church of Laodicea. And he said these words, you're neither hot nor cold, and I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. And I'm telling you, that hit like a laser beam to my soul. And I realized in that moment, yeah, I had made Jesus Savior, but I had not made him Lord. I had not given him control of my life. So if you're here today and, and you've never given control to Jesus to be Savior and Lord of your life, I want to encourage you to do that. It's nothing magical. Just stop and, and tell him. Say, Lord, I, I keep screwing this up. Would you come be Lord and Savior of my life? It's that simple. The Bible says if you believe in your heart and confess with your lips, you will be saved. If you're here today and you've made this commitment before, but you keep catching yourself running like I have back to the, the, the disordered desires or manipulating and treating other people in ways that are, that, are, that are harmful to them, all you need to do today is, is repent, turn, and put your hope and faith back in Jesus. Find your identity in him and not the things of the flesh. The other thing I want to say to us today is um, that there's a reality that we have as much responsibility to how we treat everybody else as we do to how we treat our own bodies. And, and oftentimes we get into these battles of us versus them or Republican versus Democrat or, or black versus white or a sexual identity or whatever it might be. And we find ourselves uh, wanting to battle these battles and fight these with, with other image bearers. See, the truth is every single human being that you will ever come in contact with or ever have come into contact with is an image bearer of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And we are called to love them. The job of the Holy Spirit is to convict the world of sin. That's not your job. Your job is to love people unconditionally and show what it looks like to have your eyes fixed on him and not the world. Amen. I wanna read something to you from a buddy of mine in closing today. Good friend of mine, he's a pastor, his name's John Reiner, and he's a pastor in La Crosse, Wisconsin, does almost the exact same job I do here at Jacob's Well. And I asked his permission to read these and thought about trying to reword it for myself, but he's a better writer than I am. So I'm gonna read what he said. This is a, back in 2020 on the heels of the coronavirus starting and, and all of the controversy around the United States with the, the George Floyd uh, trial and all, or all the things that transpired with that. Not trial, but the stuff that, that transpired. And this is what he wrote. He says, as a pastor, Christian, and human, I've been thinking about this a lot over the past week. Somewhere along the way, it seems like our message about humanity shifted from Genesis 1 to Genesis 3. We got this idea that we're fallen, we're sinful, almost as though that's where our story began. Remember, our story began with Genesis 1.27. We were made in his image. But instead, he goes on and says this. He says, we, we, we look at it this way, that in the beginning, mankind was evil. So when acts of violence, atrocity, injustice happen, we say, there it is again. We've fallen, we're sinful, we're evil. That's who we are. And I wonder if at times we're too comfortable settling with the idea that someday we have a hope of escape or of rapture. 
We think to ourselves, I can't wait to escape the world of pain and evil and hate and injustice. But until then, it's just how it is. But our story doesn't start with Genesis 3. It doesn't start with sin and evil. Our story starts with Imago Dei. We are image of God. That is who we are, who we all are. We are all images of God, reflections of the divine, structured by bones, covered in muscles, and wrapped in flesh. That's our value, our identity. That's our call. Our value and identity is not determined by what country we're from, what language we speak, what the color of our skin. Our value and identity is not found in our politics or place on the socioeconomic ladder. Our value is imago Dei, image bearers of God. You, me, George Floyd, everybody, all of us. He has value because he was an image bearer of God, an imago Dei. Since we are somehow spiritually connected to this sameness, this oneness, when one of us or a group of us are not recognized for their innate value, it should impact all of us. It should hurt us. We are image bearers in value, but also in calling that we reflect the character of God, which includes justice. There is a justice of man-made laws, but there is a deeper justice, a God-made justice. As the Imago Dei, it is our calling to speak for justice, to stand for justice, and ultimately to, to the best of our abilities, live justly. I do not know what it's like to experience deep-seated anger or prejudice. I do not know what it's like to experience brutality or be a victim of abuse of power. However, as the Imago Dei, maybe I don't need to. When one is not valued, it should impact me. When one is caught in oppression, it should hurt me. And when others cannot speak, I should use my own voice to do whatever sphere of influence I have. In that way, it's not enough to say this is just how it is. Instead, I should live to restore things to how they were created to be. I do not have all the answers I humbly admit at, but maybe I can speak to this one thing, restoring the image of the Imago Dei. Our job is to be image bearers. Would you pray with me? Wait, before we do that, a couple of next steps. I always forget this part. And this is super important because how do we return to Imago Dei in our own life? It's by connecting with being like Jesus. So we've given you some tools. The Devo, um, inside the Devo, there's these uh, spiritual practices. And I feel like we're going to be a broken record on this. So just come prepared that probably in the next 20 years until Paul and I are dead and in the grave, we're going to talk about spiritual practices because they are the key to being. They're the key to knowing Jesus. And then I want to really encourage you to read a powerful book that we read as a staff back in the fall. It's a book called Live No Lies by uh, John, John Mark Comer. And um, that book's also mentioned in the in the devos out there. And, and it just talks about this idea of what the real battle is. The battle's not against other human beings. It's against flesh and blood, our own flesh and blood, sin. It's against the world and it's against the devil. But it's not against other humans. They're also created in the image of God. Let's pray. Father, as we um, leave here today, I do pray, Father, that we would do the things that lead us into a deeper relationship with you. Things that keep our eyes and our heart fixed on you, the author and perfecter of our faith. And Father, I pray that as we think about our identity, that we would find it solely in you, that we would turn our eyes away from the things of this world and turn them on to you so that we would see you at work in every aspect of our lives and that we would bring to you the glory and honor that you deserve. We pray this in Jesus' name.